Welcome to the Dispense Magazine podcast with news and information about medical cannabis. We talk about the things you and your doctor might talk about. I'm your host, Sven Hosford. In this episode, it's Cannabis Conversations at Saliva Wellness. This is a discussion about PTSD, what causes it, what are the symptoms, and what are the effective treatments. Specifically, we hear about the challenges to find just the right medicine for those who are suffering. In this episode, we talk with mental health expert Sarah Macon of Macon Wellness. We talk to a combat veteran named John who wishes to stay anonymous. And we talk to pharmacist Amy Scott and patient education director Zach Kesnek, both with Saliva Wellness. This is what it sounded like on November 29th, 2018. Welcome, everybody. We are here for another journey into Cannabis Conversations, the podcast we do for Dispense Magazine. Uh, we are at Saliva Wellness uh, in Squirrel Hill, and our topic tonight is post-traumatic stress disorder. Is it disorder? Okay, thanks. Um, we happen to be in a, in a zip code where the topic of PTSD and trauma is going to hit very close, or has hit very close to home for us. Uh, Saliva Wellness is in Squirrel Hill, and many of us have uh, heard that name in the national news, and uh, there are actually people on the staff here who know some of the, knew some of the victims of the synagogue, and uh, we're probably going to talk a little bit about uh, that kind of a trauma and the post-traumatic stress that goes with that. Um, but in honor of those who passed on, um, I'd like to offer up a moment of silence on our podcast. Thank you. So we are here at Saliva Wellness. And we have the lovely Lexi, who's going to give us a, a rundown of what's new here at this dispensary and your new locations. Yes, so two new things. Um, our cranberry location opened up November 20th, and we are also collecting canned food goods um, at our cranberry location as well as our Squirrel Hill location. Right. And that'll continue until December 30th. Awesome. Okay. You guys really do a, a nice job to uh, support the community here. Yes. So we have uh, four very interesting panelists uh, with us tonight. First up, we have Sarah Macon, who is the owner of Macon Wellness. She's a two-time number one best-selling author and a strong advocate for medical marijuana, and she actually does PTSD and opiate addiction diagnosis at her practice. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks. We also have John. John is a combat veteran and he currently has a very high profile job with a large corporation here in Pittsburgh, so we're not gonna upset his, uh, his employers by using his last name tonight. How are you doing today, John? Very good, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Amy Scott is a graduate of Duquesne University with over 30 years of varied pharmacy experience. Very neat trick since you're only a day over 30. And um, she has done community practice and managed care practice. She is currently a pharmacist here at Salivo. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. And we have Zach Kesnick. He is the director of education uh, and a patient care consultant here at Salivo as well. Yeah. Nice to have you. Thanks for having me. So let's start off with Sarah. Uh, you're our resident uh, mental health professional here tonight. People use the word trauma in a lot of different ways. Can you give us a nice Con, con, uh, concise definition of trauma? Yeah, trauma is an experience that someone could have observed or have has heard about or has um, witnessed that was really upsetting to them and kind of negatively impacts them. It's an experience that stays with them and um, it's it can seem very real, like it's uh, reoccurring whenever they think about it. Yeah, let's get into that a little bit. There's a difference between being in the trauma and being in the post-trauma stage. Can you yes. describe that a little bit? Yes. So when someone experiences trauma, um, they could have acute stress disorder. So basically it's um, acute stress reaction. And um, 
they could be experiencing like the flashbacks, the increased anxiety. I'm thinking about the event a lot, but in order for it to be PTSD, the symptoms have to be occurring for a month or longer. So after um, the event has passed after a month, then they may, they might have a PTSD. So there needs to be some time that separates the two. Yes. And then, Tell us what the normal process of trauma is. Like, what, what, what are people expected to be like when they're in trauma? Well, everyone uh, responds and reacts to trauma differently. Um, there tends to be a lot of hypervigilance or increased arousal. Um, the person could be feeling very anxious. They um, could be feeling very on guard. Uh, typically, they tend to have a lot of negative emotions and feelings, um, a lot of negative beliefs about themselves, other people, or the world, um, and can many times completely go out of their way to avoid any type of triggers or uh, to avoid anything that reminds them of the event tends to be the biggest. Now, the types things. of things that cause trauma vary quite a bit. Yes. You know, uh, a divorce of a parent can be a traumatic event. Mm -hmm. But as long as it's, there are symptoms, let's say, well past the time of the trauma, then that can be considered a form of PTSD. Yes. Yeah. So there are, addi like, there are additional things that, are, that need to be, um, like certain criteria need to be met in order for it to be um, kind of like officially diagnosed with PTSD. But... The event in and of itself does not matter. What does matter What does matter is that the person's perception of it is traumatic, which is why so many people experience similar things and one person might be traumatized and the other person might not be. It's a very subjective um, thing. Right. Yeah, I was just going to ask that. One person can go through a car crash and nothing and another person won't be able to get in a car and drive. Yeah. Do we know why that's that's so different? Is it is it the... the the condition of their uh, nervous system or, or what? Do we know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could play a role, but majority of the time it depends on the person's perception. It depends on the person's life experience um, and what their beliefs are regarding the event. And if they have, you know, emotional support, if they're able, if they're in a place where they're able to start kind of processing it, that tends to help a lot too. Can you talk about some of the different kinds of symptoms that you see in your practice? Mm -hmm. The biggest ones I would see are hypervigilance, the negative emotions, uh, negative beliefs about um, people, like like the person has negative beliefs about people or themselves or the world, and nightmares, flashbacks, mm -hmm. complete avoidance of uh, any uh, triggers. In, in what kinds of things can be triggers? Um, anything that reminds the person of the event, it can be people, places, things, even certain smells. Um, for instance, if someone was sexually assaulted and the person had cologne on, mm. they might get uh, triggered by cologne. We actually, none of our staff wear perfume or cologne because that can be very triggering. Wow. Cologne yeah. can be triggering. Oh, huge. Wow. So the uh, smells bring back memories more powerfully than any other sense. You're nodding over there, John. Can you want to jump in and, and sure. emphasize that? Um, so, I mean, I, I can very closely relate to like smells, um, sounds, and light, I would mm -hmm. say, are the, the biggest um, response factors. I mean, it can be anything from, you know, uh, I'm driving down the road and the light from a sunrise is very specific to um, a time when I was, you know, in a uh, Humvee and was actually blown up and it that little bit of light and the way it reflects can be very um, make you recall that event. And then anything from the uh, crunching of rocks, like the sound of rocks under someone's feet um, can bring you back to, you know, uh, indirect fire that we had on a base because of the type of rocks we use to, to, to like keep from the mud. Um, and then smells are probably one of the biggest, like you said, um, I, I personally like to stay away from dumps, um, mm. the smell of any type of trash or burning trash, um, specifically from Iraq and 
Baghdad, the, those, those types of smells or burning or rubber burning um, very quickly bring you back into a moment where you, you, have, you can quickly relate to that. And the experience then, the post-traumatic experience is like a reliving. And it's not just a memory, but it's actually like a reliving. Is that yes. accurate? Yeah, the mind experiences is experiencing the event again, which is why it's so challenging and so yeah. emotionally disturbing. So up until this point, what were some of the traditional normal treatments that are out there for people for PT, with that PTSD? For the longest time, psychoanalysis was the uh, prime, uh, predominant modality that was used, which, is, which essentially meant that the person talked about the trauma over and over and over and over and over again, which actually re-traumatizes the person. So that is not, I mean, certain clinicians and certain uh, practices still use it, but that is definitely not a modality that's used. There's actually absolutely no research behind psychoanalysis. Wow. no and research is, behind psychoanalysis. Yeah, it, the research, it's not a um, evidence-based practice. Okay. But now so you, it's not effective. We're going to get into, well, first we'll talk about the, the, a lot of drugs are prescribed as well. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's not even get into that. We all yeah. know that that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to talk about opioids tonight. Um, so you do something called cognitive behavioral therapy. That's yes. a very specific type of therapy. Can you explain yes. that a little bit? Yeah. So the whole thing with cognitive behavioral therapy is essentially seeing what the person thinks and believes about certain situations and helping the person think differently and essentially to think more positively about whatever situation or circumstance they're going through. And we really can train our brain to think differently. Absolutely. A lot yeah. of people think we're stuck in this, you know, uh, merry-go-round of thoughts that we can't break out of, but you're... Yeah, well, it's, it's, I mean, a lot of people have that belief because majority of people have the same beliefs and thoughts in their head, like 95% of Thoughts are like the same thoughts they think over and over again. Mm. But in, in all actuality, we do have something called neuroplasticity, which is one of the reasons why we have the medical marijuana as part of our uh, PTSD and opioid use uh, disorder treatment, because the research shows that medical marijuana um, actually increases neuroplasticity in the brain, which, de which decreases once you hit 35 years old and um, older. And describe neuroplasticity again. Oh, neuroplasticity is your brain's ability to kind of uh, connect like new neurons and um, okay. think differently, basically, think differently. is what it helps you do. Huh. Whenever the more, uh, the increased neuroplasticity you have, the younger and kind of more uh, focused your brain is. And that's why it's easier to learn things as a young person. Yes, okay. because their, name, their brains are very, uh, has, their brains have very high levels of neuroplasticity, that's why. Yeah. And you're saying cannabis increases those levels? Yes. Yeah. Medical cannabis absolutely does. There's lots of research uh, proving that. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's now, awesome. you also in, engage with a couple of uh, therapies that delve into what we might call quantum physics. That yes. gets a little exciting to me, but maybe some people need some, some help in understanding that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Quantum physics. No, every eye glazed over in here. What's going on? <laughs> So you've got EMDR mm -hmm. and thought field therapy. Yes. Yeah. Just really quickly explain how those work. Okay. So whenever you start to look at more kind of like energetic healing modalities, the idea behind them is that everything is just kind of energy. You know, everything is made up of atoms. And if you look up closer at atoms, it's just energy that's vibrating in a different frequency or has different oscillation rates. So it's, t it's said that you're body is nothing but energy. And whenever we experience trauma at times, it can get uh, uh, physically stuck in the body, which is why yoga is such a lovely thing to incorporate into treatment if possible as well. But essentially what uh, thought field therapy does is whenever you have a certain uh, stuck uh, thought, uh, like a certain stuck thought, negative thought or emotion in the body, it helps to release it by using, by um, the person tapping on certain acupuncture pressure points while thinking about the thought. Um, different, tapping on different acupuncture pressure points accesses and releases different uh, 
emotions. So even though they're doing that, reliving it once more time, this time they're actually releasing it. And yeah, not, not it like releases traditional therapy. Yeah, it releases the emotional charge that's associated with the um, event or the trauma. So if the person thinks about the trauma again, they're not as upset because the emotional charge is significantly decreased or even eliminated at times. Now, even though that sounds kind of crazy, you actually did research on this. Sarah. Yes, the, there's research uh, showing its efficacy. And from your from your practice, your daily practice, you've seen great success with these. Absolutely. I mean, we are the highest rated and reviewed um, outpatient mental health practices around. Wow. So, wow. And you've only been open a year. Yes. And you're, you're here in a bit. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's because no one else is doing this. No one else is really taking a truly holistic approach to mental health and to addiction. So, and, and that's really it. It's like yeah. you're the first mental health professional that we know of in the state that's out there saying, you know, you will help with the diagnosis of mm -hmm. PTSD so that people then can get their, their card. How many people are walking around with undiagnosed PTSD, do you think? If I had to say percentage of the population, I would probably say maybe like... 35 wow 35% of people wow yeah so i think you had told me uh, in the first podcast we did that something like 70% of americans experience some sort of trauma in their mm -hmm. lifetime yeah and then um, out of that 70% about 20% actually develop ptsd wow and that's about 44.7 million people just in the uh, us alone wow What's that? How many people does 35% get treatment? Yeah, how many get treatment? How many of the, that 35% get treatment? I'd probably say about like 20%. PTSD is very, very painful. It's very emotionally uncomfortable. It's very painful for people. So when people incre uh, experience an increased level of pain, they're much more likely to seek treatment. And, and there's nothing to be, I mean, this is a disease. There's nothing mm -hmm. that shows like a lack of character or a lack of spine or a lack mm. of anything else in your nervous system. Uh, this is just the normal thing that happens, and this is how our body processes. Yeah, it. it's a normal reaction to a very abnormal and, uh, and very upsetting event. Oh. Well, that's encouraging. Let's um, move on to John here. John, um, you've described some of the, the things that... Um, that kind of trigger you, what other kinds of experiences do you have? Do you get the, the night things, the day things? Or tell us what your life is like. Um, so, I mean, really probably the biggest thing overall that affects multiple parts of my life would be sleep. sleep. Um, you know, the lack of sleep obviously is like kind of puts you into a cycle. So, you know, you, you, you tend to stay up more. You tend, when you do sleep, you, you know, have lower amounts of sleep. When you do wake up, you wake up early because of, you know, either you're caught in something or you kind of wake up because of other reasons. Um, so sleep is probably one of the biggest things that is a constant battle. Um, and it's something that I've struggled with for years. Um, and I wouldn't say, you know, I'm closer than I've ever been as far as sleep, but um, I pretty much take uh, almost the maximum dose of trazodone each night just to actually fall asleep. And that will usually keep me asleep for three to four hours. And that's really about all I get unless something else wakes me up. Wow. Um, and, you know, not to hit on a bunch of drugs, but, you, you know, you guys made mention of that. And I, I would like to, you know, kind of say as I left the military and kind of got out, um, I was probably on 10 different prescriptions um, just to kind of manage different things. And um, it took me probably three years of, you know, psychiatrists and counselors and people working with me to get to the point where, you, you know, we kind of segued off of a lot of those drugs. Um, even working through, you know, it, it actually took one um, psychiatrist who was really aggressive, who was just essentially like, I think these are causing more problems than the problems you do actually have. 
So, you know, I met her essentially every other day. She took me off of almost everything, and we kind of just worked our way back into what worked for me. Um, wow. So, you know, that was a multi-year <laughs> kind of progression to get me to the point where I was at least sleeping at night consistently for a couple hours, um, and to a point where I was, you know, more and more functional. Um, over longer periods of time and actually able to go to work consistently, you know, there's a lot of things that sleep affects, especially in a, in, in workplace. Yeah. Um, so I, w I would say sleep is definitely by far one of the biggest things that is, you know, I, I don't know how many people probably, but you, you know, you lay down and where does your mind go? Um, and if you already have a sleep problem, you know, it's that, it's that much more. Mm -hmm. um, as far as day to day, um, that's a more difficult answer only because it really depends on the day and it really depends on what you're doing and you never really know what's the thing that's going to kind of impact you. Um, you know, when it, it, it first, it was, you know, just an overall frustration with myself because the amount of anxiety and impact it had on my, you know, daily life and you didn't really know what was Sometimes you don't know what's going to cause that anxiety or that instant flight or fight response where you get that adrenaline rush and all of a sudden you just, you, 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 for, you know, I'm prior military, so I don't really get a flight response. I get a fight response yeah, yeah. Uh, every single time. Wow. So it's, so you, it's just one, one option for you. Then. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, that you, it, that took a long time to understand what kind of things cause that. Um, and understand that it's the, you know, the avoidance tactic isn't always going to work. Especially if you don't know what's going to cause the trigger. Um, you know, and, and it also took a lot of time for me to figure out what those things were. Um, it isn't always apparent. And, you know, even years later, there would be something um, like the example I gave about the light, like a very specific mm -hmm. sun, sun rise because it was early in the morning. That was a very specific incident that I was actually driving to work, and it, it actually greatly affected my my day. Um, and you don't know what things are going to cause that, um, so you kind of have to work through that. And you know, keeping close with a counselor and being able to have that confidant and work through that. And then obviously, I brought um, my service dog with me today. So you know, working through a program that helps you understand what those triggers may be and He's usually pretty tuned in to where my frustrations are. Um, you so know. Does he actually recognize then if you get triggered? So part of my training with him was very specific to how I react to anxiety. And okay. they focus on that because typically people have a physical response to anxiety. So, you know, he focuses on watching for rises anxiety levels. Um, for me, it's a lot of physical like tapping movements, rubbing across my legs, pacifying motions, um, hands through my hair, stuff like that. And they, you know, I took a year of partnership with him and training just to get to the point where he knows when I'm frustrated or when my anxiety wow. is high or when those things. And he, his, the whole point of him is to interdict. So mm -hmm. at, before it gets into a, a spiral effect of anxiety. So he's really good. Um, you he, find that effective? Does it really work for you? Um, so, you know, I spent a year training with him and then I spent a year with him afterwards before we were even like, fully partnered. Mm -hmm. Um, and he went to work with me every single day. And, um, I would say it's, it's highly effective because there's a lot of these anxiety triggers and these physical responses that you don't even notice yourself. Um, you just react and he makes you aware that you're in that state and it's starting to rise up. Mm -hmm. And just by making me aware of that gives me the ability to separate myself from the situation. So, you know, my, I may be in a meeting and my anxiety is starting to rise and I don't know what's exactly caused that. Or maybe it's something from the morning that is, you know, already put me into a, a high anxiety state. Um, I'll start tapping my foot. He'll throw his paw right on top of it. Wow. Um, and just that little bit of, you know, it took me a while to, re you, you know, you start out in small steps as far as like, okay, if he, inter he interdicts, no matter what situation it is, I'm going to remove myself from that situation to more of a understanding of, okay, if he interdicts now, I know that I'm getting that state and I can make the decision to respond differently now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that time 
you know, through that has helped me be able to be where the point, you know, now I don't actually have to leave. Um, I don't, I don't always have to be with him. Um, I sometimes am self-aware now because he is, you know, through my time with him has made me more aware of my physical response to some of these things. So the dog actually brings more mindfulness to your life. Exactly. Even when he's not he, around. He, he helps me understand some of my, like some of the things that I reacted to naturally that I wasn't aware of. You know, I'm aware of the point where I'm really, really ticked off and I'm at a fight response and my adrenaline's high and my heart rate's really high and I'm sweating. Like, you know when you're at that point. And at that point, it's almost too late, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're, you're in the middle of it and now you're, you're having a very, you know, deep response to whatever has occurred. If you catch it early enough, you have, and you have the mindful enough, you're mindful enough to understand, you can actually take a step back from the situation and realize what's caused it and Hmm. be able to kind of interdict yourself. Wow. I know there's been some backlash by some combat veterans that feel that um, they kind of own the PTSD uh, label. Do you understand why some some vets get annoyed when people they call them snowflakes and say, "Well, you're just not strong enough to get through, a, you know, a car wreck or something"? Because like combat is like got to be the most intense thing that we can go through as a human being, would you say? And do you understand why some vets would like to keep that as just a veteran's issue? Um, not really. Okay, good. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I would say not really. And mainly because one, I'm not, I mean, it took me a long time to accept that label as something Mm -hmm. that I was willing to say that this is something I have in the veteran community. It's, it's widely, um, known and accepted that, you know, if you categorize yourself into that place, you have a problem. And it's taken the military years to get to the place where they even accept it. Um, the point in which, you know, uh, I'll put it this way. In 2008, when I was in Iraq, and I was in um, Baghdad, um, my entire brigade was labeled just before they could actually leave the military. They had to go through inpatient care, mm-hmm. mental health inpatient care. And it took three years for them to actually put that on that brigade. So we lost so many people in such a short period of time, but it took three years for them to realize that that was even necessary, Hmm. that they were having so many issues and suicides and problems with the people that went through that deployment. Um, So the label itself was very negatively viewed in the military um, all the way through my deployment, even in Afghanistan. And if you were known to have that, that was that was viewed very negatively in the community. So one I was going to ask, that was my next question, actually, is there still a stigma about being labeled with that within the military, the ex-military, the veterans community? So I would say it's it's starting to change. I would say in the last three years, it's it's kind of changed. It's more accepted. Um, it's more widely known because of a lot of the things the military has realized that is causing these problems. Um, but I would also say, you know, you put a bunch of, you know, high adrenaline guys in a room and you try to one up each other all the time, you know, admitting you have a weakness is never really accepted by the group. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's that, co- that kind of mindset. You ha- the military is just not that place where one wants to admit weakness. Right. Um, especially if you're in any type of, you know, um, special operations or any type of organization that has that go, go, go mindset my weakest link, you know, causes us all to fail. Yeah, yeah. So you went from one stigma there on to another stigma, uh, or just tell me about um, the stigma of cannabis. How is that accepted in the military or the, the veterans community? So the, the, I would say the difficulty with can, cannabis with the military is obviously is not accepted in DOD in any way, shape, or form. So most people that are coming out of the military, the vast majority who have any type of intelligence background or have worked with special operations or any of those organizations, usually have a clearance. And that's their bread and butter getting out of the military. Uh, honestly, that's what makes them money as soon as they step mm-hmm. out of the door is just having that clearance. You can walk mm-hmm. into a job that pays close to six figures. 
So for them, the acceptance of cannabis has always been a hurdle because of clearance issues. Mm -hmm. Um, That is one thing that the government has been very clear on, and still to this day, they do not accept that. Um, They have since had to open themselves up more to it, but they have only done it in the manner of first time or exploratory use uh, when you know doing a background clearance. Um, medical cards are still something that is not widely accepted. You can't hold a clearance with that. Um, and it was one of my decisions why I left government service. Okay. Um, it was uh, overall the government as far as like working in a federal position or working in DOD, um, any type of drug use is, you know, frowned on extremely. And it doesn't matter what type of condition or research or whatever that, that obviously that stigma still rides with that. Uh Um, and then you also have periodic drug tests that, you know, you can't really get around that. Yeah. You can't, if you're in the military, how about in the veterans community? Is there more wider? So overall in the veterans community, at least, you know, within my friends, it, it, it becomes, it is widely um, accepted if you're not in that, that, that clearance. If in the clearance thing. Once you're outside of that, um, it's amazing how fast people segue from it. I'll put it that way. Um, (laughs) Well, it's because it's effective, right? I mean, well, you know, I've seen it anywhere from people who I know who have had extreme um, PTSD, whether it be diagnosed or undiagnosed. I've had friends that have been on deployments, you know, were on my deployments with me, um, all the way to, you know, guys that I've just met who, you know, they were so excited to get out of any type of government or clearance job just because that's the first thing they were like, I've just heard this helps and I just want to try it. Like, if it helps me sleep, I will take it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, I would say the acceptance is, is, is there. Um, I don't actually see any, any veterans groups really fighting <laughs> against that. Um, they, they all seem to be pretty much in favor of it. Um, yeah, I mean... Most of most group, I, I see more groups fighting for it and even supporting it in in treatment in the VA and you know different avenues like that. Um, and then you know, obviously there's a lot of groups that are even you know telling people how well it has helped them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, earlier I said how many different drugs am I on? Was I on for a long period of time? Um, and one of the reasons why, you know, I also went through cancer and multiple surgeries and chemo and, you know, obviously cannabis has a huge impact on my, you know, ability to handle pain, uh, eat, function through some of that stuff. And, you know, a lot of those things I think are, you know, viewed very positively Mm -hmm. by those groups, um, and I, I also see a lot of people that are kind of more standing up and coming to the you know, mic and saying, this has done this much for me. It's, done, mm-hmm. it's changed the way I've done this. I'm no longer, no longer on blood pressure meds and uh, SSRI and uh, anti-anxiety mm-hmm. and a sleeping med. And, right. And the list go, and oxycodone and like, right. You can this huge list of all these meds that the VA is more willing to stack on you. Um, and yet, you know, a vape can change, you know, what you take, when you take it and how often you take any of those things very easily. Mm-hmm. Um, the I think one of the biggest problems with the VA is the accessibility to meds. Mm-hmm. Um, For the longest time, the VA, you know, I would maybe check in once every year and I would get 60 uh, tabs of Oxy and about 120 of Tramadol per month um, on top of anxiety meds, sleeping meds. Per month? Per month um, on top of everything else. And I just got, eventually I got to a point where um, I couldn't even finish, you know, that much in a month. And, you it's know, like when I realized I was actually storing that amount of stuff, I, I just kind of realized this is, this is not working. It's not effective. Um, and the interest, one thing I will definitely say, and I know we didn't want to go down the drug route very much, but um, when I moved and actually segued my way out of taking uh, oxycodone, you know, pretty much daily, um, a lot of other things that were going on kind of also dropped out of the picture too. Mm. So that, that was pretty impactful. So the, the pain meds 
we're kind of at odds with the, the, the uh, psychological meds in a way, weren't they? Well, I mean, you have to look at it this way. Your pain meds are a depressant, mm. right? And typically depression and PTSD and the self-doubt and the, the you know the hatred of self go coincide with that. So well, taking pain, any type of, of excess downer, pain causes a depression as well. And did that feed the PTSD? So I don't know if it necessarily fed the PTSD. I would say it 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 definitely played a part in the um, depression and, and the doubt in self and the ability to function. Because, I mean, for me, one of the hardest things was going through chemo and cancer. And, um, you know, there's, you know, eight hours of chemo every single day for three months straight depresses you overall, wow. just watching your body waste away. It was an ICU three times. So on top of that, I've, um, you know, I had a bilateral pars defect from being blown up in I Iraq. So, you know, the loss of muscle there obviously caused more mm. back pain and more slippage you know, in, in a whole bunch of other issues. So it kind of got to that point where you're like spiraling in depression, but you're taking depressants to handle the pain. Mm. And, is a you know, cycle. you're barely functional just yeah. already from chemo on top of all the stuff that you're already dealing with. So it, it's, it is, it's a cycle. It's, it's a yeah. really crappy cycle to be stuck in um and it takes time to get out of it mm -hmm. it takes time and a lot of support and a lot of people to help you get out of that well that's that's good advice there well, i want to give you credit i mean first of all for coming on to the panel here and talking about this but also i mean full disclosure we're buddies and you told me about how after all of these things you went out and and started working out and won a bodybuilding competition i did <laughs> That shows, and that just takes an immense, tremendous amount of mental strength. Well, I kind of, I kind of got to a point in my life where I was, you know, I, I realized I can either sit here and be depressed with my body and the horrible state that it's in, and be a victim, or I can go out and change um, it for myself. And I kind of realized that there's a, there is a large community of people that have gone through cancer and chemo. And the impact it has on your body, like, I just saw people who felt like they'd never be the same. Yeah. And that was the constant dialogue I saw across forums and on social media. It's just like, oh, my body will never be the same. And, you know, to think that a disease or your treatment for that disease puts you in a state that is so bad that you'll never be the same person, um, I just, you know, I've, I've always prided myself on being a fighter, even through the military. You know, I was, I was, uh, I'll be damned if cancer or chemo is going to be the thing that, you know, puts me in, in that place where I don't feel like I can come out of it. Um, so in that, I, I just kind of came to a, like, what is something that I've never done? One, um, mm -hmm. what is something that most people can't do? Um, and I was like bodybuilding. It's something I always like being in the gym. So I just, wow. I was, I, I called one of my old trainers from, um, my special forces group. And I was just like, listen, I want to be in a bodybuilding competition. He was like, what? <laughs> I was like, no. And this I is wanna, you're like 30% metal right now. You told me at one point. Or? Um, so my right foot's been reconstructed <laughs> from an IED blast. My left arm's been reconstructed and then wow. my back and neck have been broken. So, wow. um, so I, I called him up and I was like, I'm going to do this. So we put a date on the calendar, we picked the show that we were going to do pretty much January. I jumped in the gym. I did not deviate from diet or miss the gym one day wow. uh, ever for an entire year. It was pretty miserable, um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, but I was like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go full force, wholehearted in. And about right. midway through... You know, because I was doing like progression photos and, you know, I kind of had a social media following about like within six months. Um, I kind of found there was a lot of people out there that had the similar, like, similar thought of like, I don't want my body to be like this, but I'm, I feel like I'm so stuck because of all the damage that has been done. Um, so I kind of had this outpouring of people on social media cheering me on. So that really got me, you know. <laughs> Uh, motivated, and by the time I hit cut phase and went into my show, um, I won state. Uh, I won two other subclasses uh, for men's classic physique, and then um, I made uh, nationals. Wow, <laughs> that's fantastic! Yeah, let's do a little applause for that. Um, 
Well, again, I really appreciate your, your sharing with us, and uh, I'm sure we'll have some, some other questions from the audience uh, here in a bit, but I do need to get on to talk to uh, Amy, our uh, pharmacist here at Salivo, uh, one of them now, with you guys are expanding. Tell me, uh, how common is the PTSD in the patients that you see? I don't have hard and fast numbers, but it's definitely in our top three diagnoses of people okay. that we see on a regular basis. Wow. So it's pretty high up there. So it matches kind of Sarah's prediction that up, upwards of 20 to 35% even of Americans run around with, with PTSD. Yeah, I'd say that's true. And these are folks that are truly diagnosed. So. And how, how does your, this, I found this, when preparing, I found this really fascinating. How do your recommend, recommendations change depending on the symptoms of the PTSD? Yeah, I, I think it's a lot about sim symptoms and what part of the day your symptoms arise. Some people have generalized anxiety throughout the day. Some people have more nighttime problems, whether it be falling asleep or staying asleep because maybe there's night terrors or what have you. So it's important just to kind of tease that out. We don't need to know so much details of the actual traumatic event or anything like that. It's more important for us to know when your symptoms occur and, and what are they? You know, is it more anxiety symptoms? Oh, thank you. Is it more... Um, <laughs> You know, general anxiety symptoms, is it panic? Yeah. What is it that we can try to um, help and you with in Taylor? Whether it's daytime or nighttime. Right, that's very yeah. important. Very so important. you have specific strains that you know are good for sleeping or anxiety and that sort of thing? Yeah, not only strain, but formulation. So does a patient need a more long-acting agent? Or like a vape is sort of like rescue because it works so quickly. And maybe they need a combination of the two or even three. It just depends on the individual. It's very individual, I'd say, and um, it does help to know if, if, they're, if they've ever used marijuana before, medical or, or not really, and what result they're having. Have they used CBD before? There's just a lot of pieces to put the puzzle together, I think. Do people who have some experience with cannabis do better with these treatments? Or is I, it about I don't know about better, but they just have a little more experience they with more it, experience. that's all. So that makes... That's actually a, um, I think that changes the way you think about it. If you've yeah. had experience with it, you know what to expect to some degree. Do some people have anxiety about yes. just actually taking it at Absol all because it's Absolutely. still federal or illegal? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, we had a fascinating talk about how it's so important for you to get those symptoms out of the patient so you have a better idea of what's going on. But at the same time, you want to be respectful and boundaries and and especially not to trigger that patient. Um, tell me more about that dance. You know, how, how vital is that, getting that symptomology into getting the right medicine in their hands? Yeah, I, I think that's a definite, delicate dance, really. Yeah. But again, it's more about to, when we're having these conversations as to trying to find out your day. What is your day like? What is your night like? Can you tease out for me when, if you had to prioritize, let's say, when is the worst time of day for your symptoms? And then we can start there. It isn't necessarily the only place, but it's a good beginning to find out. And that's an important thing, what time of the day? I think so, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What other kinds of, um, what other things are important for you to be able to make a, a correct diagnosis? Well, I'm not diagnosing, well, not, so, just to, yeah, be, just just to be clear. Um, to, to, be, to offer the correct medicine. Well, so. to understand if a person's having their anxiety in a social situation, sometimes mm -hmm. that's, that's part of it, depending on maybe their traumatic experience. Um, again, or is it more about can they, do they feel they can't le even leave the house? That's another thing you want to talk about. Or again, is it more like nighttime nightmares that you're kind of have anxiety about going to sleep because you know that's going to happen or you're anticipating that. So all these pieces help us help the patient. And do we have a pretty good or do you now have a pretty good idea of what are the best things for what kinds of symptoms? Or I is think, it still it's pretty I much think, a work in progress? I think in right? general it's definitely a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very individual. Oh, that's true. Very yeah. much so. Depending on not only symptoms but preference. You know, people do have a, this is a little bit different than traditional, you know, prescriptions per se, where you take this three times a day and, and you follow that regimen. This is a little more, um, there's a little more wiggle room for patients to kind of learn their dosing and see what helps them the best. 
And also, you know, the first thing they try might not be the best thing. Mm -hmm. It just depends on, again, the symptoms, the time of day, what we're really trying to accomplish. And so it's a, it's a little bit of a journey to mm. find the right um, regimen for someone. And in, in general, what um, uh, Richard Greer, your, your compatriot here, has been on talking about how one of the big differences between cannabis medicine and traditional medicine is in Western traditional medicine, the doctor gives you strict orders and you follow them precisely. And that's pretty much not the way it's done over here. And, and part of that, you have to teach the patients that they are the captain of their own ship. And do, do PTSD patients have trouble with that or are they more likely to want to take over as captain of their ship? I haven't found that they have any more trouble with that than anyone else. Okay. It's just a learning curve to yeah. get to, to understand that you are actually in control. You're in control of your dosing. You're in control of when you take this medicine. So it's almost like you have to be a little more aware. But of, doesn't it give them some feeling of empowerment? Absolutely. Like they get some more control over their life? For sure. Yeah. I Go always say it, to the patient, I say, you know, we create the road in the car and you take the wheel eventually. Uh, okay. That's really what I say to them. That's great. That's mm -hmm. great. What do, do the patients talk about? What other kinds of treatments they've tried that have worked or other things they've tried that didn't work? How much do you get to know all that kind of stuff? Well, again, it differs per patient. Some, some folks are more willing to share, and that's fine because the more we know, actually, the more we can help tailor it to them. But mm -hmm. it is good to know if they're using cognitive therapy or if they're using EMDR. Did I get that right? Um, or, or what have you, because these things really are best in conjunction. Just like all, uh, yeah, I mean, treatment is, should be holistic. That's excellent. Oh, I should say that, Every, and this, I love this about Salivo, every first time patient has to see you or Richard or one of the other pharmacists on their first visit. Can you explain a little bit about the policy, the philosophy of that? Sure, I think it's basically a medical model to kind of go through a patient's history, learn a little bit more about them, and find out what their goals of the treatment are because that's really important as well. So what are they looking to achieve with, with medical marijuana? and then again work together and then after they meet with us and we kind of go through this go through the safety profile talk about side effects because there's always a side effect to everything and talk about the different formulations make a recommendation and then they go into the dispensary where they now have a little more edu some education and then they get a little more from mm -hmm. zach and the rest of the team in there mm -hmm. to again tease out what might be best for them and I would like to just echo that. Uh, so my first experience with medical marijuana was actually here. Um, and I had my time with the pharmacist who's sitting actually back here in the audience. <laughs> and he, you know, he was extremely helpful because obviously, you know, I, I came from military background. I also came from government service. So, you know, I had a clearance. I've never touched marijuana before this mm -hmm. time. I had no clue what I was walking into or what I was going to experience or what even options were. When he started going through the multiple options, I'm sitting there like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, I have no clue at all what you're talking about. And, and, he would ask me, like, do you know what a tincture is? I'm like, nope. <laughs> nope, should I? <laughs> so it was extremely helpful, and it kind of, like, gave me a ground-level understanding of, like, what options are out there, the time frames that they, you know, they have, the different, um, what are the strains, mm -hmm. right? And all that was, like, very crucial for me to start understanding and know, like, what path I, you know, and I, I like the analogy of, like, eventually you'll take the wheel, mm -hmm. and that was very important to me as I was moving through and looking at these different options because I did I kind of tried out different ones and found like a couple that work for me and I found out some that didn't mm. and it does it depends on your life it depends on you know your day-to-day -day use um, when you have the most of your symptoms you know what your overall goal is and I, I think it's very important that's great so they see the pharmacist here and then they come to see you Zach yes sir so let's let's talk about what happens when the rubber hits the road mm -hmm. You're right there, you're telling them how they're going to take the wheel. Yeah. Um, what, how, how do you normally handle the first uh, conversations? So when a, a first, when a patient first comes to Saliva, they see the pharmacist, and then I get their file, and I basically um, review uh, all their everything, um, their med history, uh, the actual diagnosis, um, 
we don't ask them what how they got the PTSD, and I think right. that's unnecessary. Right. Um, right. If they're a veteran, they usually you know they usually wear it right on their sleeve, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Join my driver's license. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a recommendation section on my paperwork, and you know, if they're experienced, it's usually you know the the world is your oyster, essentially. Um, but sometimes I have uh, you know strict guidelines that she gives me, and the first time <laughs> I know I, you point to her when you yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> me and her, she'll come in, and we'll she'll be like. Hey, can I? Do you think we should do this? And I'm like, yes, definitely. You know, we're always on the same page, so mm. I'm glad we're actually here talking um, together. But it's a team effort. Yeah, yeah. it definitely is. I can see that. Yeah. I believe that um, you know the first time I usually go with that recommendation, um, unless I am a patient myself uh, for irritable bowel disease. Um, I also am going through Lyme disease, so I'm using it for mm. other modalities as well and other reasons. Um, but I believe that certain... No, that's, that's what they call off-label now. Lyme disease, I know, is not one of the 21 symptoms. Correct. 21 conditions. Correct. Correct. But you have found relief from the symptoms with cannabis? Um, somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. You know, it's, it's, okay. it's troubleshooting. Um, but, yeah, definitely. I mean, with everything. Yeah. But um, I have the ability to try these strains. And yeah. I am very good at recognizing the particular part of my body and what it does. Um, I really hone in on that. Um, so I think that's what I provide best for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so if I see something that a strain that I see might cause like the sativa jitters I call, if it gives you mm. too much energy with someone who has PTSD, too much anxiety, why do you need to get more excited, you know? So do the high CBD strains generally kind of where you steer people so to first? It really just depends on um, their experience. Um, it also depends on their willingness and belief in the medicine as well. Um, but it, it, it really is individualized. It really is. May I add something there? Please. I think that the CBD and THC piece that you're bringing up also depends on a person's um, desire for function, to mm. be more functional, um, or to be less functional. So I, I think CBD is a great in combination with THC as well, but that's also another piece to kind of take into yeah. consideration when you're having that initial and follow-up conversation. Sure. And sure. that kind of leads into, you know, the cannabinoids. I'm going to call them phytocannabinoids because it's from the plant. Mm -hmm. But there's over 80, and people only recognize about, like, two. Yeah. And well, I've actually heard that there are more like hundreds. Yeah, there's hundreds. hundreds. I said over 80 just but, to keep it real simple. Yeah. <laughs> they actually stopped well, we giving them. We won't put any bad science on yeah, there. Yeah. Okay. Um, but is there 80, 80 been identified? Yeah. Is that more accurate? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So and been they identified. stopped doing acronyms. They just are doing reference numbers at this point, which is oh, pretty wow. funny. But CBD modulates the THC, and it you know decreases the uh, dysphoria that THC can cause. Um, so, yeah, in certain situations, it's important. And, you know, if, um, it, again, the conformality and belief in the medicine dictates this, but, you know, a higher CBD, like a 20 to 1 or a 10 to 1, which causes next to no psychoactivity, of course, I'm going to be 100% comfortable. And if, you know, if you were never comfortable, I would never let you leave my site. Seriously, that's how I do it here. You know, like, you have to be 100% comfortable. You have to know exactly what you're doing. You know, right, and right. the fact that some people you said... Um, came back to uh, some people are kind of like some people come to me and they say can I take two because they're used to that the western medicine approach and I'm like yeah you know you listen to yourself mm. you know that's really how this goes so yeah so. get them to listen to their own body that's got to be a big challenge yeah. mm -hmm. do, do people with PTSD want to escape out of their body more and that's why it's the challenge of wanting to get them to pay more attention hmm. is that an accurate statement well, I, we should ask Sarah that I was going to say, I think yeah. you and you could yeah. answer that, but, you know. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's it. Absolutely. Did I get it right? Okay, good. Especially with uh, se with um, people who have experienced um, sexual violence or have mm. been raped or have been assaulted in that way. That is uh, one of the biggest um, things that I've noticed. So would you say a high THC is better for that kind of trauma or lower? If, if that works well for the client and helps okay. them get more in touch with their bodies, that is great. Um, I'm not too much of an expert with I, the strain. I think yeah. it's hard to make that generalization, honestly. Yeah. I think it's a bit of a bit of a um, 
somewhat of an experimentation phase to find out what is best for an individual. And again, based on what goal we're trying to achieve. Right. And, that, and that is different for every person, no matter what of the, which of the qualifying conditions that they come in here with. So just like cannabis is not cannabis, it's so many differences. PTSD has so many differences as well. That's Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and I would echo that. You know, it depends on, you know, if you're having trouble sleeping because you're waking up because of nightmares or something like that, obviously, you know, something more long at lasting, something that's extremely sedating, you know, that's, that's the direction you want to go. If you're having high anxiety and really all you're trying to do is have a calming effect, you know, your approach is a little different. It may not mean that I need something that's going to hit me for eight hours really, really strong, mm -hmm. just if I need to, you know, calm down a little bit. Yeah. Right. So like yeah. your approach and what your symptom is at the time, and that's the really cool thing about, you know, having multiple options, different dosing, and being able to kind of feel out what, how your body's responding is you don't have to always hit yourself with the big guns right up front. Mm -hmm. You can kind of feel out and like build to the point that you feel better or you feel like it's working. So you, you know, your approach, uh, and I will say like, even my approach sometimes is never the same. I may, you know, vape a little bit just to, you know, calm myself down or relax or, you know, turn my, you know, turn my brain down a little bit. Um, but some nights uh, I'll decide to take a pill because I know it's going to hit me for a longer period of time and I can have a nice chill night and, you know, have a longer period of time without having to cause it. it everything's a little bit different and I don't sure. feel like, you know, you have to say one approach is in, is good for people or a certain type of PTSD or a certain type of symptom. And I'd like to just add that even within that, you, whatever you're using, whether it be a vape and or a capsule, you might need more of the vape at a certain time mm -hmm. because this is dose dependent. Mm -hmm. So you take one small inhalation for X, you might need a little more for Y, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to learn how your body handles it and how, how it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. Well, Zach, when, when you're giving these recommendations, I mean, so we've already seen that, like, we, we're not really able to say, from what I'm hearing from everybody, you know, these terpenes or these cannabinoids or, or this ratio is the perfect match for this kind of PTSD. It's pretty much up to the, the client. But when you're, when you're making those recommendations, you're comfortable that you know what the effects of those terpenes are or that ratio or that strain or generally what are the known kinds of um, reactions to those things. And then that helps the patient make the decision. Is that more accurate to say? Yeah. So um, the biggest thing with cannabis or cannabinoid therapy is the entourage effect. You know, it's not just THC. It's not just the cannabinoids. There's Glad terpenes, there's yeah. flavonoids. There's a whole bunch of things that can uh, work in like an orchestrative type of way, I like to say. And, uh, you know, I also like to say, the cannabinoids are kind of like the car and the terpenes are kind of like the driver. Mm. So the terpenes kind of dictate the effects that the THC is going to have. So for example, like linalool, which is the most prominent uh, terpene in lavender, very calming. You can kind of see the association, mm. mm -hmm. but I know that that is going to be anti-anxiety. So if I see, uh, you know, and some of these companies have cannabinoid and terpene profile, so I can actually look at it and really like kind of understand what they're even going to do before I even try it. Okay. Um, which I'm pretty good at that's pinpointing good. that. Yeah, but that's good because that's your job. Here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it should be. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's definitely correlations with terpenes, cannabinoids, and again, just honing in on the individual day and how they respond, just in general. So that's where with that entourage effect. That's why a certain strain might be more uh, um, work better for somebody rather than saying, okay, I know it's these three or four terpenes or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and there's over 500 terpenes, so you can imagine how many combinations of cannabinoids and terpenes there are. So, yeah. And there's over like 5,600 strains, so you can imagine how much different relief there is out there. Huh? So that's why it's going to take 100 years for all the science really yeah, to kick in. Yep, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. that's amazing. They'll catch up. <laughs> but without giving away any personal details, are, are there any particular success stories that you like to share with us? Yeah, uh, I can actually remember my first PTSD patient and this guy, he came in and he was just like mopey and kind of not staring, looking at me in the eye and like real standoffish, but like I understood, you know, I make, try to make him feel as comfortable as possible. 
Um, went through the consultation. The next time I saw him, he was like bright eyed, like had color. He was like, you wouldn't even believe it. I'm like cutting people's grass. I'm like making coffee for people. And I'm like, awesome, man. You know, and he like kicks the door out, you know, but yeah. So, I mean, so I've seen it work really yeah, well. I've seen it work really well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Amy, same thing. Yeah. I've seen, again, not only for PTSD, but for some other diagnoses, people come back and there's a physical difference actually mm. in their demeanor. Um, just simply the way they're even speaking and talking with people. It, it's you can see it visually, and it's it's amazing actually. Wow. Yeah, I can. One young young person was here, and she had a lot of serious anxiety. And um, the first day she was here, she was you know in tears, and it was very emotional. And she's been back a few times since, and she's doing just so much better. And just to see that n makes me know we're doing, you know, good work. Do you ever experience anything in that, that other world of pharmacy that was as exciting as this? You know, on occasion. On occasion. <laughs> there, there, were good, there were some good events there, too. There were that's some good. not so good. Yeah. But, you know, that's, I think that's fair to say across all, you know. Have, Amy or Zach, have you had anybody with some very negative reactions to cannabis yet? You do, okay. Yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? We've had people, well, I would say more of older patients kind of, I mean, pediatrics, geriatrics, you have to be very, very cautious with. Um, but I know I've, I've had someone hallucinate, you know, and that's, and that that's, would, that's as significant as I can say. That's generally going to be disturbing to the Correct. patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th there's some other lesser um, things yeah. like side effects that people do get, whether it be reaction, itchy rash that even people get that from could get that from cannabis i've had a, a couple and even some gi kind of nausea vomiting mm. so you know you have to treat this prudently and carefully and like any other medicine so i think that's what we try to do yeah and people come in all the time and they'll say uh you know being hungry is a side effect that people don't like as well Oh. And people come in and say that all the time. Like, I'm, you see, I'm not trying to gain weight. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, you know, there are some cannabinoids that do kind of balance that out. So, you know, I look oh, for something okay. specific and we try it out. So it, all works. cannabis doesn't make you Correct. get the munchies. Correct. I view it as a spectrum. Mm -hmm. you know, You're going to get hungry no matter what, but it's like, is it that much or you can't live without a cheeseburger or something? <laughs> But also remember, being informed is that you're ahead of the curve. Yeah. So if you know that this might increase my appetite, well, then you can be aware of that and either eat more healthily or, you know, watch what you, what yeah. you ingest. So, yeah, yeah. so there's all pe lots of pieces to this. I'm, I'm just very aware I need Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, the negative effects, I try to turn this into a positive thing. It's like yeah. you are playing guess who you're seeing what doesn't work you know mm -hmm. and you're kind of seeing your guidelines of like what fits your individual self so it's imp everything's important when you come in here and, and talk oh. to us so yeah oh, that's great mm -hmm. i would like to 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 finish by letting everybody have like a, a final say so about what we've talked about here tonight and since you've been the most quiet here since we started sarah let's uh, start with you and just say okay. based on all this conversation you've heard you know what did you like? What did you learn? What important points did you want to make about it? Or did we miss anything important? I would say that the most important point is if you're out there, if you're listening to this right now, and if you have been struggling with trauma or um, having uh, the hypervigilance or flashbacks, please get help. Is it fair to say that if somebody thinks they have PTSD, there's a fairly good chance they do? Yes. Majority of the time... Uh, they do. There is also um, PTSD screening tools that are online. Um, you can go mm. online. You can do one and see if you fit criteria that way. Um, you can see a therapist. You can see a psychiatrist um, for an evaluation. And um, if they're smart, they'll come to somebody like you who knows quantum physics. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, there's help. It's possible to feel better. And the most amazing thing is seeing people get better. Yeah. Um, 
especially whenever they're using And you've seen cannabis marijuana. really work well in your practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whenever I first um, started to do evaluations for PTSD and opioid use disorder, we started to, you know, do follow-ups with our clients and see how they were feeling. And the results were so, so amazing. I've, I myself, I haven't seen pharmacology do the same um, for our trauma clients. So it's really, really amazing seeing yeah. how counseling with medical marijuana can be um, so helpful to so many people. That's great. Zach, any last thoughts, uh, ideas that you want to share with us? Uh, I definitely want to reiterate to get help. And um, even if you are concerned, if you may have it, again, you probably do. And, you know, Cannabis is going to change the world, in my opinion. We all have an endocannabinoid system. I think that, you know, an endocannabinoid deficiency is correlated to PTSD. Um, Very good point. I think that there should there. I know that there's hope, and I know that things are going to change in the future. So, ask about marijuana. That's great. Medical marijuana. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. I'd actually just like to thank the patients actually for coming and sharing their stories with us. And we're learning from them as well. So the more feedback we get from patients and we, all of us, whether it be in the dispensary or if they come back to see any of the pharmacists, that's how we're actually expanding our knowledge as well from patient experience. So one of, that's really important. So that's thanks great. to all. John, we're going to give you the last word. <laughs> all right. Um, I would just echo, you know, if, if, if you need help, seek it out. Uh, I can completely relate. Sometimes seeking out help is probably some of the biggest anxiety you will ever feel. Just walking in the door Mm -hmm. is sometimes painful and knowing that you may even have to talk about that experience again or relive it or um, even admit that you have a problem is sometimes one of the hardest things that you might do. But that's um, that's the worst, right? That and it gets better getting from Getting in there. the door and admitting and, and having that open discussion and at least starting that healing process is the hardest part. Um, you know, you, you may have uh, rises and falls during that time period, but, you know, it does get better. It does take time. Um, there are, you know, a support structure and having people in your life that care about you and are there to support you and are able to talk through a lot of these things and help you find things that work for you is absolutely key. Fantastic. Well, thank you um, again, Sarah Macon, John, Amy Scott, Zach Kesnick. Thanks for being on the panel tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody thanks for, for having being us. Here. That concludes this episode of Cannabis Conversations live from Saliva Wellness. Tune in again next time for more conversation about medical cannabis here on the Dispense Magazine podcast. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Mindful Medicine, LLC.